A lot of people will see the video length and go, holy hell I'm not watching this, which is a completely understandable reaction. But by clicking on the video or whatever brought you here, you obviously really like video games, so you might find some of what I have to say interesting. If you've only come for a specific part, I have timestamps in the description separating it out into bite-sized sections. I've done my best in keeping my thoughts organised, but I find that difficult to do when it comes to this game, which I can only explain by being as direct as possible. There are parts of this game that I love. They perform better than any game I've ever played, and I thoroughly enjoyed the first 10 hours of my playtime. My opinion on these few hours are so positive that had I written a review after playing only this section, I would be showering the game in praise. However, as I continued to play, my enjoyment began to deteriorate. How could a story that started this strongly fizzle out into nothing? How could the game be this horribly imbalanced? Why is the game entertaining the idea that it's offering an immersive realistic experience when it's only a medieval themed game at best? Questions I will hopefully answer within the meat of this video. There will be spoilers from here on out. I think I should begin with a realistic experience the game is selling that just isn't present, which might be off-putting at first since the game certainly looks like one. This is why I'm calling Kingdom Come a medieval themed RPG, because Warhorse Studios really hit the mark here. The game is beautiful, although that's highly subjective. I'm no historian so I can't comment on the accuracy of the world, but who cares, right? It looks like I'm in a medieval world, but it doesn't feel like I'm in a medieval world. Each of the gameplay elements breaks the illusion of realism in one way or another. I'll start with the main questline, and to illustrate my point, I'm going to skip to a quest called Needle in a Haystack. To set the scene, Henry, your playable character, needs to infiltrate a bandit gang, and their initiation test is to kill a turncoat bandit called Pius, who's voluntarily taken up a life as a monk in the monastery to hide from his killers. This is the equivalent of a life sentence. Instead of being executed, you devote your life to God and do his work within this confined space. Your job is to infiltrate the monastery, discover which of the four novices Pius is, and kill him taking his diocese as proof to the bandits. If you report to Sir Radzik before entering the monastery, he'll offer a reward for Pius's capture instead, giving you an alternative end to the quest. This all sounds good and interesting, it's certainly the most complicated quest available, but the game is woefully unprepared to make it fun and engaging. As a monk, you live by a strict schedule, every single day. It begins with a two hour prayer session, where you go to the hall and stand there for two in-game hours. You don't interact with anything, you just wait there until it's time to eat where you sit down at the table and watch Henry for another two hours. After this schedule, you perform your first job, brewing potions. You brew one set of potions, then wait for the two hour block to finish before moving on to your next job, where you translate one book and wait another two hours. There's another two hour prayer session, then another two hour eating block, then there's two hours of free time before the night curfew where the cycle begins anew the next day. Playing through this is about as fun as it sounds. It's just an elaborate waiting game wait in the correct spot and you won't get punished. You can use the wait function and pass time faster, but that's flawed because of how it works. The schedule is separated by the hour, but waiting doesn't skip to the next hour, it skips an hour at a time. For example, if the time is half past three, the wait feature doesn't skip to four, then five, then six. It skips to half past four, then half past five, so on and so forth. This means you can end up overweighting and suddenly you're being caught for neglecting your daily schedule obtaining a strike next to your name to show for it. Three strikes and you serve a day in prison, having your items confiscated. What you are supposed to be doing during these waiting periods is to snoop around and investigate who exactly Pius is. With some basic talking and walking into areas you're not supposed to, there's a few mysteries that you can investigate. The suspicious mess in the cellar, the locked cabinet in the library, and why does Siskin trust nobody? Many of these are investigated by clicking on the right dialogue option when talking to someone or going to the right place at the right time, rather than reading in between the lines and acting accordingly. This either gives you a piece of information or triggers a side quest to improve your relations with the other monks. However, you are trying to uncover who Pius is, and an investigation usually leads to building a case against someone and then accusing them. Many of the other mysteries are unrelated to this, but during ones that are, you can find an overwhelming amount of evidence that Antonius is pious, through his bandit stagger, and that he's the only novice who volunteered, but the game never gives you a chance to accuse him. You can confront him about the dagger, but he tells a sub story and nothing happens. The you're pious and I'm arresting you option never opens, which I'm going to assume is bugged. There's going to be a lot of me saying this, that this feature must be bugged, because in the less than ideal state that the game is in, it's impossible for me to tell if something is intentionally missing or isn't working properly. 
The reason I say this is because currently the only way to have the game confirm that you're right about Antonius being pious is by telling him that you're investigating him. Then he poisons you and gives a monologue after you miraculously survive and asks for your help in escaping. This has got to be the most counterintuitive way of confronting a prime suspect ever, which is why I think it's bugged, but it's impossible for me to properly say. With the identity of Pius discovered, you can kill him or help him escape. You do this by ordering pig blood to fake a death, and yeah, that's totally going to convince everyone. Then you open the door and walk out. You can choose between letting him go free or arresting him for Sir Radzik triggering a fight, and that's all she wrote. So why am I targeting this quest in particular? Was it really that bad? Well, no, no it isn't. What is interesting is that during this quest, you're dealing with a small-scale section of the entire game. There's side quests to complete, a law to abide by, and relationships with other people to maintain. You're even performing an investigation, so the similarities are there, to say the least. Which means the two big problems that every quest suffers from are present in this condensed version of the world. A lack of choice, and tedious gameplay elements. The latter is the easiest to explain. This quest has you waiting around doing nothing because realistically, this is what monks would do. They would pray, eat, perform God's work, and socialize before bedtime. So you will too because of realism, regardless of how monotonous it is. There are similar tedious aspects present in other quests during the game, the most common being waiting until a specific time for a quest to be available, or having a specific amount of time to complete the quest in. Key examples being the Nightingale Patrol, you can only join him in the afternoon, and the Johanka side quest, where if you don't quickly find this man an antidote, he will die. This adds an element of time management to your schedule. I must do this quest now or I won't be able to, or I can only perform this quest at this time, so I'll efficiently use the time before that during other things. Time management is a common form of simply adding a challenge or interesting dynamic to your game, such as a challenge that is created by the Ghost in Spelunky but it only works when you have limited time to manage. There is no such limits in Kingdom Come, so managing your schedule becomes sure. There's nothing to punish me from using the wait feature and fast forward to the required time for the quest to be available, so why force players to wait in the first place? The same goes for time-sensitive quests. It's never built into any sort of challenge. It's just there because, likely for realistic purposes now that I think about it. If I ever found one, I postponed whatever I was doing at the time, completed the quest, and then returned to what I was doing. It never added a new twist in gameplay or forced me outside my comfort zone. It was something I had to babysit instead. It also didn't help the majority of these quests are boring to complete. Side quests being simple fetch quests or combat encounters didn't bother me too much. These were activities that you grinded through for Groshin and training, but when the main quest line requires you to traverse the world and collect X amount of Y, or travel to a spot in the world to trigger an observation, and then ride all the way back to report your finding, or simply forcing you to wait while the quest also completes isn't great. Not every quest needs to be adrenaline pumping levels of exciting, all I ask is that they are interesting, not riddled with time wastes and annoying mechanics to simulate realism. While it somewhat achieves this, the game also happily includes unrealistic mechanics that completely contradicts this goal. Your horse will teleport to you whenever you call it, and you almost always have access to its inventory. After obtaining the human dustpink perk, you can eat rotten food without any consequence. Every potion in the game that increases your stats, or improves your vision, or heals all your cut wounds in minutes is nothing short of magical. Characters you can build intimate relationships with forget everything after the quest allowing it is finished. By increasing your knowledge of maintenance, you can force armor to make less noise. Somehow. And every time a citizen accuses you of committing a crime, they're always right and guards move to arrest you, even if they're the only witness, in which case my story should hold just as much truth, but no, you're always the culprit. The game is only a simulation when it suits it, making the tedious, realistic parts stick out like a sore thumb. The lack of choice is certainly the more drastic problem of the two. Kingdom Come is an open world game, which in theory means that there's different ways you can beat it, completely open to your imagination. In practice, the game is quite restrictive in what it allows you to do. We can see this while completing Needle in a Haystack. The game has three ends to it. Kill Pius, let Pius escape, or arrest him. Three very specific options that gives the illusion of having freedom of choice, but if that was really something the game offered, there should be two more alternative pathways. The first is through pickpocketing. The only thing the bandits want as proof of Pius' death is his die, so you should be able to steal it from him and convince the bandits that he is in fact dead without ever killing him. 
this isn't possible. The die doesn't exist until the quest is completed, so even if you try, the game won't let you. The other way is to deliver him to Sir Radzik yourself, which is what I ended up trying to do. I devised a plan to kidnap him during the night, then ride away with him to Ratte, claiming my reward and his die to prove his death. And I did it. I knocked Pius out and carried him the whole way. This is clearly insane, and the game obviously wasn't prepared for someone to make this slow trek across the whole map, and treated me like I was breaking the law. When I arrived, the guards arrested me for harming the innocent, never letting me explain myself. I could never present the evidence and prove that this was a wanted criminal and that I was here for my reward. The game wouldn't let me. I was forced to leave Pius and serve 10 days in jail. Once I was released, Pius was still waiting for me, uninteractable. The game broke. It didn't know what to do. I ended up reloading because I couldn't progress. The fact that both of these completely reasonable and realizable pathways to jump this hurdle are impossible shows that you're playing by arbitrary rules set by the developers and that you shouldn't pay attention to what's happening. It's a lesson I learned the hard way earlier in my playthrough. It was during a quest called Ginger in a Pickle. A witness has escaped fearful for his life and you have to hunt him down. Your only lead is his charcoal burner friend, so you snoop around and interrogate them. Soon enough, I found a stubborn person who I had to threaten to get talking, and he told me, very specifically, Well, fine. I've heard that they're hiding him in some remote cottage, at the edge of the forest on the way to Ujits. Knowing that I was leading an investigation, I decided to take this lead, and I spent an hour trying to find Ginger's elusive hideout. I ended up finding a place that matched the description I was given, but the game wouldn't let me investigate it. The only thing that the person living there could tell me was where the charcoal burners were, the same people who sent me here. If you've played the quest, you'll know that I just wasted my time, because what I was supposed to do was talk to a different charcoal burner who will tell me Ginger's exact location if I killed some nearby bandits. Am I an idiot for not figuring this out? Perhaps, but the game is also at fault here. The charcoal burner's information was false, but I was never able to prove that it was false and get a different lead. The other charcoal burner's dialogue instead updated the main quest and marked my map with a marker telling me where to go, which taught me that the game would only react to my choices if it was intentionally included in the quest, which is exactly how it works for the rest of the game. Early on in your time at the monastery, you are told that food is checked and everything is precisely portioned out each day. If something is stolen, the kitchen staff will know, so don't even bother. You then find a monk who will only buy food off you, so if you want to make easy groschen, you can raid the pantry and sell it to him, at the risk of being caught. However, despite the alleged constant pantry checks, there's never a punishment for doing this. Mealtime is never impacted, there's never an investigation, your reputation with monks stays the same, nothing happens. When talking to Siskin, you'll find out about his stash of contraband, which you can then steal for yourself, or you can report it to the authorities and get Siskin imprisoned. When he leaves, he chases you down for being a cunt, and then fights you. Shit, you just made an enemy, and it would be natural for him to hold a grudge. Nope, doesn't happen. His attitude towards you resets after you spend some jail time for the brawl. You talk to him like nothing ever happened. The most jarring change of them all is by opening the doors. Being a monk is a life imprisonment, and many of them aren't here by choice, so when given a literal open opportunity to escape, they should all try. But not one monk does. I don't just mean that they try and they fail, they don't even acknowledge that the door is open in the first place. They just keep on trucking along their soulless lives, never deviating from the script. And that right there is the crux of the issue. The game is on rails. It will only allow you to choose from a specific list of options, and damn you if you try to break out of line. Sometimes you can't even try, the game will force you to the script's next page instead. While learning how to use a bow, Lord Capon will berate Henry, who angrily reacts and challenges him to an archery contest with a wager. You can't stop Henry from doing this, it's something you have to go along with. Agreeing to have one drink with Father Godwin apparently means drinking all night until the cows come home. During the main questline, you'll find the dying bandit pleading for help, and you're given a variety of different ways in telling him to go fuck himself. The worst one of all is during the attack of Pribislawitz. Fuck that is hard to say. When Sir Radzik's forces near victory, Runce, the man that stole Henry's father's sword, will attempt an escape, and Henry decides out of his own accord that he's going to chase him down and confront him in a one-on-one -on -one duel. And you must fight him. The game won't advance until Runce is dead. This not only strips the player of any choice in the matter, it completely alienates anyone who decided to focus on stealth or speech rather than combat. 
As one of those people on my first playthrough, this fight was almost impossible. I had to cheese him with arrows instead, which was followed by a cinematic showing Henry overpowering Grunt with a sword, a blatant misrepresentation of what he was capable of at the time. These contradictions between the gameplay and narrative sections present throughout the entire game was what shattered any immersion I had and proves just how stuck on rails the game is. The archery contest with Lord Capon is the first time Henry has ever picked up a bow in his life, yet he can beat the well-practiced archer flawlessly. I don't think Capon's excuse explains this away. At Murrowhead, I'm so sorry, the people are infected with the plague, and Melikar entrusts Henry, who during my playthrough couldn't read properly and had no knowledge of medicine, to not only investigate what illness the town was cursed with, but to create and administer the cure. I wasn't allowed to deny his offer or find someone who could do it instead. I was, apparently, the only person in the whole kingdom suitable for this job. Late in the game, Henry, who is likely a very capable and durable fighter, and can shrug off arrows and sword cuts like they are nothing, gets knocked out cold due to one swift blow to the noggin. The cinematic even removes any headgear you had equipped to ensure that this makes sense. Your escape is just as bad. You get told that taking back your confiscated gear is not worth the risk, but it's just in an unguarded chest with a key right beside it. Then it devolves into nonsense. Pius voluntarily took up a life in the monastery specifically because only monks are allowed there, making him virtually immune to outside threats. However, if you've travelled to Sassau and seen the big building with every door locked, it's very likely that you'll get curious and break in just to see what the fuss is about. You gain access to the monastery, even though you're not a monk. So why does Pius think he's immune if anyone can get to him if they have the key or can pick a few locks? Why did Henry have to become a monk for the initiation? Captain Bernard can train Henry from being useless with a sword up to knighthood in a few days with some sticks and a commanding voice. So then why are the lords worried about the size of their army if it is that easy to train someone? Henry can learn how to read through one lesson with the scribe, followed by some private reading for practice. So why isn't everyone reading? You might think I'm being harsh here, but I disagree. All I'm doing is taking the rules that are established during gameplay sections and applying them to the narrative, then wondering why these ideas aren't even considered. The integrity of the world comes crashing down once you start thinking about it, much like any potential for immersing yourself in its world, despite the developer's intentions. Many people won't care about everything I just talked about. They picked the game up because it was a medieval themed action RPG, and that's all they expected. These same people are probably on the verge of falling asleep waiting for me to start babbling on about the gameplay, and I won't keep these people waiting any longer. Just like it is advertised on the Kickstarter page, the gameplay is mostly divided into a series of elaborate and repeated minigames, varying greatly in complexity, and somehow an element of tedium managed to squeeze its way into all of them. By far the most tedious part of the game is sitting through loading screens. This isn't really a critique of the gameplay itself, but these are unavoidable and present everywhere. Talking to an NPC? Loading screen. Eating from a pot? Loading screen. Triggered a cutscene? Loading screen. Disabled motion blur? Loading screen. Launched the game? Loading screen. Your experience with this will vary. I played the game on PC, and while it isn't quite up there with the recommended specs, it annihilates the minimum ones. I don't know how bad this is on consoles or on higher end computers, but everyone is likely being interrupted by them. Hopefully this is a bit of criticism that becomes redundant. The other bit of tedium that manages to sneak its way into the gameplay is how much you have to repeat the same boring stale minigames. To show this I'm going to go through a rapid fire discussion of each of them. Haggling shopkeepers for cheaper prices is by far the simplest minigame of them all. When buying or selling, you can persuade them to give you a better deal just by changing the slider and see how they react. It's simple, repetitive, boring, yet I found myself enjoying it every goddamn time. Just a simple promise of being able to rip these traders off was enough to have me see how far I could push their patience. Smiling as I walked away after selling a rusty sword I found on a bandit for 20 groschen more than its asking price. This is a guilty pleasure though for sure, and I should probably be ashamed for liking this. Farkle was also a minigame I found myself enjoying as well, although I'm hesitant to praise the game for this since it isn't an original idea. It's a real game that is played, so this is just a port. The cool thing about this is that there's loaded die you can find and play with to tip the scales in your favour, and I wish there was more die you could collect, not just loaded ones. They could have been different sets and you could play for die, like playing for marbles, and hunt down all the die in the set. Maybe you could find someone using loaded die and then accuse them and ruin their reputation. Little things like this allowing the player to forge their own stories and objectives in the world 
really would have added to the game, although maybe that's just something I wanted. Alchemy was originally a minigame I thought I would enjoy as well. It reminded me of Cook Surf Delicious, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but I soon grew to hate alchemy. Unlike the fast-paced restaurant sim where you're rewarded for memorization and doing things faster, Henry brews potions at an alarmingly slow rate, casually grabbing a handful of this, slowly grinding it, then adding it to the pot and watching it boil. You get the idea. It's monotonous, and if you want to level your alchemy skill or efficiently brew potions to sell, you'll sit through this for hours. There is an auto brew that you can unlock to avoid this minigame, but even this becomes tedious. You auto brew from the recipe book, but after one batch is brewed, Henry steps away from it, so you have to wait for that animation to play. Then click back into it, watch the animation, auto brew another batch, rinse and repeat. Nothing you can do will speed up these animations, and after enough frustration, I avoided this as much as I possibly could. Lockpicking suffers from similar problems, although it is far shorter and non-intrusive, and obviously designed for a mouse. Good luck console players. Like every minigame, there's no variety, you perform the same motion over and over. The speed never increases, the yellow sweet spot never moves any differently, and what I was expecting, there's never any walls to navigate around. Some locks could have been maze-like to add to the challenge, especially for very hard ones. As it's the same every time, lockpicking would have benefited from an auto-unlock button once the skill had been leveled enough. Pickpocketing is something that a lot of people won't bother with, purely because the prime targets to pickpocket are all in towns, and if you get caught, they alert the guards to arrest you almost immediately. The risk isn't worth the reward, especially since it is impossible to tell if someone is watching. Some people will still try, and when they do, they're treated to the most frustrating minigame of them all. While searching their purse, you move at an infuriatingly slow pace, even if you spam the buttons, which is counterintuitive for a minigame all about speed. This becomes faster with a perk, but you have to suffer through the slow speeds to get there. The other reason as to why this is so frustrating is that your victims will randomly catch you. I've had times where I could give myself 18 seconds, other times I could barely manage 6, so figuring out a time limit that is always safe is impossible, and being at the mercy of randomness is always a fantastic inclusion in games. These are the mini-games that you'll be completing again and again throughout your adventure, although you're still plagued with many smaller tasks that you're forced to babysit. Spamming spacebar to sharpen your sword is about as fun as it sounds. I don't think I really need to explain this one any further. Stamina management while sprinting is something I'd be praising in any game. Periodically releasing the sprint button and waiting for your stamina to recharge always adds a fresh new dynamic to games. The optional challenge of making sure you release the sprint button just before the bar depletes for quicker recharges is perfect. It rewards players who've mastered the system. Every game would be vastly improved if they included this. That's how good it is. Managing hunger and sleep is something I found brought the already slow-paced gameplay down to a crawl. Constantly having to sleep before your camera starts drooping and eating didn't add anything to the game for me. These were just things that I babysat to avoid the consequences for neglecting them, made even more tedious by the fact that beds and pots are everywhere. It's here that I want to bring the game's balance into question, because a lot of the challenge that the game tries to offer is destroyed once you're established. Groshen is something that's hard to come by early on. You're looting everything and selling what you can to scrape by, yet by the end stages of the game you have so much of it that you can buy essentially everything. I was stealing during my playthrough, and I managed to obtain 41,000 Groshen worth of stuff. This isn't considering the potions that you can brew and sell, or hunt at game, or the Groshen rewards for completing side quests, or any of the other sources of income. It really makes you wonder why there's so many beggars. Savior Snatch is the currency for saving the game outside of sleeping. This was heavily criticised when the game was released, but aside from the lack of the save and quit feature, which is now there, I didn't see the problem. Beds are everywhere, and sleeping for an hour triggers a save, which also trigger at the beginning and end of quests. It made saves coming tedious, meaning that players were more likely to live with the consequences of their actions, and for that I liked it. What I don't like is how common schnapps are once you start brewing potions, it's the beverage I ended up mass producing to level alchemy for auto brewing. It's bad both because saves coming becomes an easy option, and selling them turns a massive profit. Lockpicking breaks exploration, it's impossible for the game to keep you away from anything once this is leveled. No lock can contain you, allowing you easy access to some endgame gear before you really should. But the part of the game that is imbalanced the most is the combat, even after the rebalance patch. Combat is an essential part of the game, even if you want to choose to avoid it. 
Bohemia is littered with bandits and hostile Cumans, so you'll need to be able to defend yourself, and there are four main quests that revolve around it, the three raids on bandit camps and when you deal with Ulrich. Even if you want to be diplomatic, enemies will not be willing to talk to you until you're beating them and they surrender, so some fighting capabilities are required, or at the very least you're heavily incentivized to invest in it. You'll also need the skills when you confront Runt, a kill the pacifist achievement doesn't count. So if combat is forced on every player, it better be good, and like the majority of the game, it's good early on. Offensively, there are 6 types of attacks, 5 slashes covering different angles and a direct stab, each costing some stamina to perform. What type of attacks you prioritise depends on your weapon of choice, swords specialise in quick stabs, axes and maces in wide slashes. Once you've trained with a weapon enough, you'll start learning combos, special sequences of moves that has a special animation attached to it. They either attack a specific part of the body or attack many times in quick succession. The only downside is that they're easily cancelled. Combos have 3 to 5 attacks before the animation, and they have to land consecutively. If one of the attacks is parried, then the sequence is broken and the animation doesn't play, essentially rendering these powerful attacks useless. You can feint attacks to deceive your opponent and avoid blocks, but this must be bugged because outside the tutorial, I could never get these to work. The only technique that is never explained are clinches. When you get too close to your opponent, you lock weapons and stand off, ending with one person pushing the other and staggering them. A staggered enemy cannot effectively block, which is a good way to get a free hit in or two, but if you lose the clinch, you're the one that will be taking it. Clinches are versatile in that they can also be used defensively, staggering your opponent and making a quick getaway. Your other defensive moves mostly rely on blocks. By holding the button down, you'll keep your weapon steady and any attack will bounce off the blade, costing a little bit of stamina each time. If you perform a perfect block instead, pressing block as the green parry indicator shows, you'll push their weapon aside and be in the position for a counter-attack. With no stamina cost attached to it, this is always an option. A parry doesn't guarantee the counter-attack either, your opponent can parry that too if they're quick enough, and can then counter-attack your counter-attack, which you can then parry and counter-attack the counter-attack that was the counter-attack to your counter-attack. Try saying that 10 times. This counter-attack loop can go on indefinitely until one person runs out of stamina or performs a master strike. These special parries are reposts. If you time your block well enough, I found that the timing is as the attack animation begins, just before the green shield pops up, not pressing attack as you parry like the game says. You'll parry the attack and then counter-attack in one smooth motion, which can't be parried. Performing one can also intimidate inexperienced foes, causing them to surrender. But if you don't want to chip your weapon by blocking, you can always evade attacks. As the parry indicator comes up, you can instead weave out of the way and counter-attack much faster, often while your opponent is still attacking the air. With heavier armour, the timing is sharp but with lighter armour you'll be nimbler, allowing for fast movement, but when you take a hit you're really going to be taking it. So while the game doesn't let you choose to easily avoid encounters, it allows so many options for you to fight back. You can play it safe, using heavy armour and staggering your opponent with clinches, swinging back with force while they're down. Or you can play aggressively, weaving between attacks and counter-attacking with quick stabs, striking between armour pieces and directly damaging your opponent. Or you can do a bit of both, wearing fashionable armour and intimidating foes with your stylish combos and master strikes. Or you can be that guy. There are all the workings here for an enjoyable skill-based combat system, and based on everything that I just explained, you would think that it is. Unfortunately, the winner of most fights is more dependent on gear and levels, and to prove this, I have to showcase how deeply broken damage is calculated. While investigating this, I spent most of my time with this bandit here, we'll call him John to make life easier. John is wielding a sword called Stalwart, which deals 46 stab and slash damage. I took off all my armour and let him smack me around for a few hours, fully expecting to take the full 46 damage every time, but that's not what happened. Instead, the numbers end up looking like this. When I tested it on some other bandits, this axe wielding dude and his brother Mace, the damage looked like this. These numbers look all over the place, but there's a consistent relationship between the three data points. The head damage I sustained was about a third of the weapon damage, torso damage was around 65% of that damage, limb damage being 45%. 
the actual answers contain decimal readings, and since the game can only show whole numbers, these values are rounded, which accounts for a certain amount of error associated with this data. After establishing the base damage, I started to put on armor. With a head defense rating of 5, John's 15 damage swing became 10. With 13 armor rating, it became 2. With 24 armor, any head swing's damage was completely nullified. Same with the torso. Torso armor of 5 meant I sustained 5 damage down from 10. If I wore enough armor, say plate armor with defense ratings of over 30, John couldn't hurt me. Most swings would do no damage, occasionally some would do 1. This was consistent with the other two bandits, meaning that an approximate equation for the damage calculations looks something like this. The damage factor is added in because I know that damage is increased based on your stats. My sword does 72 damage, but the game registers 84 under my stats, likely because of my high strength rating. I'm also slightly lying about this set of data points. John's damage to me wasn't consistent. A hit to the torso wasn't always 10 damage. Sometimes it was 13, other times it was 8. There was a similar variance with the other areas, which isn't explained in the simple x tech y equals z equation I suggested. However, the Kickstarter page boasts the kinematic system, where the damage calculations takes into consideration where you hit them and how hard you hit them, and I bloody believe them. This is the only way I can explain this variance, so I'm going to assume that it is in place and working. My findings with damage calculations doesn't just end there. When letting John wail on me for one damage at a time, it eventually spiked after a certain amount of hits, around the same time I ran out of stamina. This was consistent with the other bandits as well, so I exhausted myself, let John hit me, and this is what happened. While the percentage ratios between the areas of impact remain the same, whatever defense factor that was blocking some of the damage is missing, likely because I don't have any stamina to fuel the blocks. Armor ratings are still subtracted from these new damage values, same as before. 16 head armor meant I took 30 damage, 24 armor meant I took 22 damage, 30 head armor meant I took 16. Torso damage acted in a similar fashion. 5 armor meant I took 25 damage, but once I bumped that up to 35, which would indicate me taking 0 damage, I instead took 10. Same with the legs and arms, with 25 armor I still took 10 damage. This was consistent with the other enemies I tested with weaker weapons, I died in 9 or 10 hits each time, meaning that the new minimum damage is about 10 instead of 0 or 1. This equation isn't gospel though, I can't determine what the relationship between the damage factor and the defense factor is, because this bandit leader enemy dealt 60% of his weapon damage to me, instead of the usual 30%. This might be because he has a higher strength, or because he's striking me harder, I can't say for sure. Same with this halberd enemy. The wiki says the Italian build does 79 slash damage, 30% of that is around 25, but the torso hit dealt 60. With 35 armor blocking the damage, it was then reduced to 2 instead of the expected 25, and without stamina, the damage increased to only 15. Bottom line is that I can't explain everything. There are too many extraneous variables to consider, and it's likely impossible to accurately work everything out just by letting enemies hit you and recording how much damage you take. However, my two suggested equations hold some amount of truth. I'll just wait for data miners to prove all of my theories wrong. But enough with all that math talk, what the hell do these two equations tell us? Well, additive damage calculations are insane. Usually damage calculations are percentage based, where 50 defense means a 50% damage reduction, or with some sort of diminishing return factor so you're never 100% immune. Your swing of 50 damage gets reduced to 25, 100 to 50, so on and so forth. My defense is always relevant in reducing the amount of damage I take. Using an additive calculation, if your 50 attack hits my 50 defense, you deal 0 damage. We've seen John struggle with this, but Henry can suffer from it too. Baby Henry, with low level gear, cannot possibly defeat a higher level opponent, he just can't land any damage beyond the lucky 1 damage chips. He will never be able to exhaust the opponent to begin landing 10 damage strikes, and if he tries, he'll risk exhausting himself and then being vulnerable to a counterattack or succumbing to a riposte. The only way for Baby Henry to win this duel is by escaping and returning with better stats and gear, so he can bypass the armor with more damage. As this increases under an additive system, defense slowly becomes irrelevant. The highest defense you can obtain is round 50 to 55. St. George's Sword, which is currently considered the best weapon in the game, has base damage of 72, and my Henry managed to bump it up to 84. Enemies play by the same rules you do, so if there's stamina for a block, I deal damage taking their armor and defense factor into account, only dealing a small amount, as you can see with some of the strikes I landed on John's plate armor. 
However, if they're exhausted, enemies will take full damage, meaning they will die in about 3 hits or less, even with 55 defense. Henry becomes superbly overpowered, to an unrealistic degree. My late game Henry managed to kill everyone that was killable in Rate, fuck you Nightingale. Every guard, every citizen, everyone, all while sitting in a nice comfortable 100 health. Even if I did get hurt, I could simply flee and chug a Lazarus potion for some extra health, and then continue my rampage. We haven't even discussed perks, which accelerates Henry to his overpowered state, and subsequently makes him even more so. Some perks increase your strength or decrease your stamina consumption, Blood Rush does both. Clinch Master makes it 40% easier to win clinches, so you can skillfully use them for free staggers, but all you're really doing is abusing a broken perk in higher numbers. Headcracker gives you a 10% chance of instantly knocking out a foe with a strike to the head, regardless of their armor. Chain Strike increases the amount of damage you do for consecutive hits, making defense even more irrelevant, and being more likely to make your opponent bleed out is always nice. Perks also accelerate Henry to the shockingly low strength and agility requirements to wield late game weapons and armor, if they even have one. St. George's Sword has a minimum strength requirement of 12 before it can be used to its full potential, a feat I managed to do in 7 hours. I spent 5 in the main questline, finishing Ginger in a Pickle, then trained with Captain Bernard for 2 hours, reaching a base strength level of 12. To all the people that will say, well you grinded mini you're over leveled, so of course the game is going to be easy for you, please understand that 2 hours of training with Captain Bernard equates to 2 hours of combat anywhere, responding to holdups, clearing bandit camps, or simply engaging in combat during the main questline. You also only need strength level 9, with the Savage and Brute perks you get 3 free levels of strength, and by taking them you will likely reach level 12 before the 7 hour mark, just by playing the game, no grinding required. I think you can begin to see how it's more of a numbers game than anything else, and just how quickly you can get those numbers to ridiculous levels. You can choose to make yourself weaker by using weaker armor and weapons, which is what I ended up doing during my playthrough, but it only makes combat tedious. It took slightly more hits to stagger enemies and deal damage, and that was it. I also couldn't risk making myself too weak, or combat would be near impossible. Again, further solidifying the game is based on levels and gear more than anything. But what did I expect going into an RPG? Increasing numbers through levels and gear is a standard for the genre. While this is certainly present in Kingdom Come, it also manages to live up to the role-playing part of RPG by deliberately making Henry incompetent at everything. This is an idea I've thought about for a while now, especially as games are becoming more and more narrative-based. In context of the story, Henry is the son of a blacksmith and is poorly educated. He's abysmal not only at combat, but at everything. What I expected in gameplay is that Henry would be just okay at everything, and player skill would be able to pick up the slack. This is not the case. Henry truly is abysmal at everything and will not be able to do the things the player would be able to do. This forces you to stoop to Henry's level. It forces you to play a role. This is something that caught me completely off guard, and something that I experienced firsthand when I fought Kunesh, the first bit of combat people will probably experience. I had the combat spoiled for me before I played, I knew about parries and dodges before Henry had learnt about them, so I spent an embarrassingly long half an hour here trying to fight him, trying to figure out how to parry and dodge, and then walking away in shame when I couldn't. I was wasting my time here because these mechanics aren't available until Henry learns how to do them. Even if he has learnt, but hasn't practiced enough, he might still fuck it up. Henry can't read at the start, so neither can you. The words are all gibberish, and good luck trying to make any sense of it. Henry can't pick tough locks until he's practiced enough, and if you force him to try, he'll break the pick. His incompetence shines during archery as well, he shakes more than my voice when talking to women. This makes it more satisfying when Henry becomes more adept at these things, his hands become steadier, and he becomes more knowledgeable. I mean, look at Henry fight Kunesh. Then look at Henry once as a seasoned wayfarer, the difference is staggeringly noticeable. An increase in stats makes some minigames easier as well. A high lockpicking skill increases the radius of the sweet spot while picking locks. A high defense skill gives you more time to react to the green shield. Subsequently, more levels in warfaring makes your attacks quicker, so you have more time to react to openings. A high alchemy skill means that Henry can salvage potions if you missed a crucial step, that would otherwise end up making something useless. This would also explain why combat is so dependent on gear and levels, because the game is fully embracing the fact that if you want to perfect something, you will have to practice it. 
translate into reaching higher numbers. This isn't going to be a feature everyone will enjoy as much as I did. Disempowering the player during gameplay sections because of a narrative-based reason might be a controversial design choice, but it only serves to strengthen the narrative, which is why I was annoyed when Henry becomes competent at everything far too quickly. When learning how to read, I had one lesson with the scribe and then that was it. I read books in my own time and now words were completely comprehensible. Lockpicking becomes child's play once you surpass level 5, and we've already gone to detail about how powerful Henry's combat capabilities become. This happened to me about 10 or 15 hours into the game, instead of towards the end like I was expecting. The role you play in this world was no longer a useless blacksmith trying to survive. Henry became another generic RPG protagonist. This is where my conspiracy theorist hat comes on and I say the game wasn't finished before release, and not just because of the bugs. The first few hours of the game were marvellous, as each of the systems that makes Kingdom Come the game that it is was in full effect, especially the levelling one which forced me to see the world as Henry saw it. I can't fight that bandit, he's far better than I am. Shit, all my gear is busted, I hope I don't get ambushed on the way back to town to repair it. Crap, I don't have enough Groshen, hopefully there's someone willing to play die, or I'll talk to Ringlet and win an easy wager. When Captain Bernard gave me a bandit camp to clear out, my mind flashed back to when I was ambushed by Cumans, and this happened. Fuck that I said, I'll train up a bit before I attack. These were all decisions and thoughts that I made voluntarily, and I didn't even notice how tedious everything was. When I needed to get better gear but couldn't afford it, I sent out on a grand adventure, not because any quest told me to, but because I felt like I should for Henry's sake, and it was also outrageously expensive, and yeah, fuck that. Exploring the world was a joy for me then, finding bandit camps and then running away in haste when I found myself outnumbered almost 10 to 1, coming across an ambush set out by a gang of amateurs who thought standing right next to the wagon blocking my path was a good idea. Overthinking this man's riddle and talking to this wayfarer, who was forced into knighthood by his mother, are my most cherished moments while playing the game. They're unique, unscripted situations that I found myself in, and I played through them my way, as this is where the game is most flexible. The best part about exploring for me was when I decided to fast travel back to town. Usually this means instant travel, but teleportation is unrealistic and doesn't exist in Bohemia. Fast travel in Kingdom Come is implemented in one of the best ways possible. It performs more like automated travel. The game sets you along a path to your destination and moves you along it. Time passes, you get hungrier, and the wayfarer encounters, skirmishes, and ambushes you find if you're exploring manually don't get skipped. The map highlights them if you approach and then gives you the option to investigate it or a chance to bypass it if you aren't interested. This ensures that you never miss the potential chance to find yourself in a new situation. Me and my first steed Pebbles encountered so much during the first few hours that I could never bring myself to replace him. This is why, had I written a review during this time, there would be a glowing recommendation for everyone to play this game, and why it really is disappointing that this enjoyment dwindled as every mechanic progressively disappeared or broke, along with all the challenges they provided. Ambushes lost their unpredictable nature and became inconveniences. The little groschen I could earn from riddles seemed like a waste of time compared to the hundreds and thousands I could make in other ways, and I never saw the knight again. The only real challenge left for me in the game was finishing the main questline, something the game does an excellent job of making you want to complete. Playing through scallops before it gets raised was a brilliant idea. Not only because it serves as a soft tutorial for how some of the game works, but because it perfectly aligns your motivations with Henry's. You experience the relationships that he has made with other people, see the populated town flourish and live, something the towns in the main game lacks. Then, when you return after it's been torched, you already know its layout and can easily traverse the ruins. You'll likely reminisce on the short time you spent here. This is where Fort Kanesh. This is the house we threw shit at. This is the town bar. Oh, there's Bianca. This sequence achieves the only thing it needed to marvellously. It makes you hate the villains and want to avenge the town. I wanted to reclaim Henry's lost sword, and when I got to Markvar, I had This is what kept me pushing through the game. I would confront him in this utterly overpowered state, and he won't even know what hit him. He would rue the day he burnt down Scalots. So, when the game ended without doing any of this, it's hard to not be a little annoyed. You don't even get to kill Toth, the actual main villain of the game. He escapes just before the credits. This is the sole reason why I decided to ignore the story for this video. I don't think it's fair to closely analyse it, as it isn't finished. It has such a strong opening and all the voice actors do a really good job, 
but when it builds to a confrontation that's just sequel bait, well, it ends about as unsatisfyingly as a long-form critique without a proper conclusion. There are a few little things that I didn't want to include in the bulk of the video, because they're either incredibly nitpicky, or I couldn't really fit them in properly, so here they are. This might be bugged, but some main quest items with a carry weight don't disappear or become droppable after the quest is over, essentially reducing your carry capacity forever. This needs to be fixed if it is a bug, and if it's intentional, then it has to be changed. I don't know why the aiming reticle disappears while firing a bow. The game's leveling system is all about empowering the player while disempowering the character, so why the player is also disempowered here is strange, to say the least. People have praised this for keeping things realistic. You don't have a targeting reticle when firing a bow in real life, so why should you win the game? Praise that's immediately undermined once you see there's a targeting reticle everywhere else in the game. It doesn't make firing the bow impossible, just more annoying, and hand-to-hand -hand combat was more enjoyable anyway. By making yourself weaker to not break combat, there's no reason to ever maintain your gear. Items at zero durability aren't unusable, that's simply when they lose the most stats, which is something that should be changed because this is an intentional groschen sink, and by avoiding it, you're left with even more money than usual. You can be knocked off your horse if you try riding under something that's too low, but whenever it happened to me, it just looked like the game bugged out. I think companions were a planned feature that sadly never got implemented, and after being attacked by Peshek's step collectors and having Captain Bernard step in and defend me, I wish it had. Wayfaring can get boring sometimes, and Pebbles never was much of a conversation. The options in combat would have increased too. You can hire a bulky knight to protect you as you stagger the opposition with arrows for example, or questing with a friend like Lord Capon or Teresa. It would make the bandit camp raids make more sense, having Bernard send only Henry to clear them out seems a little odd. Ulrich was a possible companion you can have during one of the quests, but he bugged and didn't help me, so I can't comment on how much it would improve the game. I liked how the final mission ends, with you riding towards danger along the same path where you once rode away from it. It highlights how much Henry has grown over the course of his adventure, something his character development focuses on, hooray to Warhorse for tying gameplay elements to the narrative. I just really wish there was a fight at the end of it. And much like how you play through Scallops before it was raised, the final mission would have been greatly improved if Toth captured Ratte instead of Talmberg. You spend far more time here, there's a quest that shows you all the ins and outs of the town, and it's where Teresa and Peshek live, the people that saved you at the beginning. Fighting for this town instead of Talmberg would have raised the stakes, as you barely return here or interact with Sir Divish, despite his fantastic voice. I think that's everything, yeah. Thanks so much for watching, I subscribe to see when my next video comes out, which is probably going to be on Assassin's Creed 2, and I'll hopefully see you next time. To set the scene, Henry, your playable character, needs to infiltrate a bandit gang, and their in in initiation, initi initiation test, fuck that word's hard to say, 